Good morning, and welcome to Audubon Park Church. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am so glad to welcome you to worship this morning. As we worship together today, we'd love to know who is worshiping with us. And so if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, drop a comment below so that we know you're here. If you're watching from our website, fill out an online connection card so that we know you're worshiping with us. We'd love for you to share your prayer requests with us as well so that we can be praying for you and with you. Uh, you can do that again in the comments section if you're on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, a great time to do this is during the pastoral prayer that will be led by Pastor Glenn. If you're watching from our website, uh, we have an online connection card where you can share your prayer requests with us, and we'd love uh, to be praying for you and with you. After today's service, uh, we will have a time of virtual coffee hour on Zoom, and we'd love for you to connect with us in that way. Uh, it's not as good as all being together in our church building, uh, drinking coffee, but it's the next best thing. And so we hope you'll join us as we see each other's faces on Zoom and talk and hear what's going on in each other's lives. I want to talk a little bit about our plans for reopening. Uh, our church, our core leadership team, and our district superintendent have approved our church for phase two. And our church will be implementing our plan and will be ready to enter phase two on August 1st. Now, not much changes is phase two. Uh, phase two is an important step as we look forward to phase three and four when larger groups can gather. And because coronavirus numbers continue to rise in our area, uh, we'll be limiting the groups that can come in our building. Uh, we will uh, send out more information this week uh, with all the details of our plan. You'll even have access, if you'd like, to the entire plan, all 30-some pages of it. Um, but uh, I'm excited and encouraged that we are making even this small step uh, towards reopening our building and returning to in-person ministry. So look forward to that letter uh, from us uh, this week. Uh, you also get a church newsletter this week that will have details about our uh, plan, and um, I'm excited to share all those details with you. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship through our call to worship. Come with what you have. For you who grieve this day, know that you are invited to bring the broken pieces of your heart. Loved by one another, we discover God's love for us. Come with what you have. For you who come with gladness, know that your melody will find harmony. Accepting God's love for us, we are called to love one another. Come with what you have. For you weighed down by too many shoulds and what ifs, know that you may lay down the burdens of guilt and shame. Loved by one another, we discover God's love for us. Come with what you have. For you who have the answers, know that new questions await you. Accepting God's love for us, we are called to love one another. Come with what you have. For you who come seeking, know that your questions are safe in the presence of God. Loved by one another, we discover God's love for us. O oh God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your word. Open our eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good works and deeds. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, 
firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. Light of the world by darkness slain, then burst forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am he, and he is mine. Father, with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell. me whole, here in the power of Christ I'll
decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back Again, good morning. Uh, Carol and I are just just back from having spent a, a few days on the Oregon coast with our uh, family and children and grandchildren something that we try to do every summer and didn't know if we were going to be able to make it work this summer or not, but we did, and, uh, and it was a good time of renewal with family members. So thank you for your prayers and thoughts, and uh, you certainly have been in mind. It's interesting, coming back home, I was just so ready for us to return to normal uh, as, uh, as a church family. And... Uh, Yet, uh, here we are, still finding our way uh, week by week. I'll lead us into our prayer time with this little bit of of reflection. Uh, While away, I spent uh, one morning just just living with and into, uh, once again, one of the great old hymns, this time uh, Amazing Grace. I spent the better part of one morning just just reflecting on the key words and lines that leapt out at me uh, from this uh, w- wonderful old hymn. The first phrase reminds us of, of that place of stripped-down hum- humility that the author, John Newton, finally got to uh, in his own uh, personal spiritual walk. Many of you will remember that Newton had a a rough start as a young man in the 1700s. Uh, He lived on his own by the time he was 14. Uh, And it was a a rough and tough uh, existence. Eventually, he found his way as a, a slave ship runner. And kind of kind of worked his way up the ladder, and uh, uh, was doing uh, administrative work uh, for th- uh, that industry at that time. Uh, finally, having experienced the saving grace of God, uh, I once was lost, but now am found. Um, And even though it it, it took him a while to truly see the the, the sin in what he was participating in. At first, after after finding this new light of God in his life, at at first he he just worked for better conditions for the people that that he was transporting. Uh, Finally, he came to see the raw ugliness of the industry that he was a part of. I was blind, but now I see. Newton's experience of of, uh, that, uh, I'm I'm sorry, his experience of, uh, of that piece by piece unveiling of the wrong that he was connected to leads one, led me again the other day to ask the soul-searching question, what are those cultural norms that I am a part of, but that I am also blind to? What am I doing that my spiritual eyes are, are only partially open to? It's hard to, to pray uh, Open my eyes, Lord, and truly mean it. 
because that prayer is often followed by difficult, life-altering decisions that are, that are painful, um, even if they are right. But then, as we read more deeply into the prayer, by the time we get to verse 4, the Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. God's grace is indeed amazing. Because of that grace, freely given, we can reap or can, can, can risk the, the, the deep soul searches that just may churn up changes and choices that need to be made. Now, pray with me, if you would, as, as I lead us through some bidding prayers. Uh, you may well wish to add your own as we make our way in prayer. This day I'd like to lift uh, former House of Representatives uh, and John Lewis. Reverend Lewis served our country in that capacity for 33 years. This day we, we give thanks for his work. We ask your blessing, Lord, on his family. We pray your ongoing blessing on his legacy and on those who work closely with him, who, who were more than colleagues but also many who were nearly lifelong friends and will continue with the torch of his walk and work. Bless this one who gave his entire adult and even youthful lifetime working to narrow the gap between thy kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Bless the servant of yours in his passing. We ask your grace, Lord, for strength to continue, for endurance, for those who have recently lost loved ones. Pray for the mothers, fathers, children, and neighbors who grieve those losses during this most unusual time. Bless them, Lord. We ask for wisdom and strength uh, beyond their own for our nation's leaders and decision makers at this time. Lend your wisdom, Lord, and fill each one with your compassion for your children. We pray, Lord, for safety for hands-on frontline workers, those whose daily round brings them in contact with great risk to their own health and, and life. Bless them, Lord. We ask, living God, for creative grace for us all. Give us eyes that see opportunities to crack open even a tiny window of joy and healing 
for one another. Continually lift us out of ourselves. Give us eyes to see and feet that walk beside those who just need a fellow journeyer to walk with. We pray, Lord, for those of our, of our own fellowship. We pray for those who wrestle with the daily health needs. We pray for those who, during this time of so much separation, who struggle with loneliness, in some cases depression. We pray for those who, during this time, are finding it necessary to grieve largely alone. We ask, O oh God, for uh, the gift and grace, for the miracle of ones who might unexpectedly come alongside. We pray for your church and ours, Lord. Fill your people with grace enough to find and live your kingdom way forward in this day. We pray these things in the name of the risen Christ. And now join me if you will. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. May it be so, Lord Jesus. In his name, we pray together, saying, Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with, hears, with, anyone with ears listen. May God add a blessing to this reading, our hearing and understanding of this most holy word. Amen. Well, today we continue in our summer mixtape sermon series. In this series, we're partnering with seven other churches from across the Northwest, and we're hearing messages from uh, these seven different pastors. Um, this week, it just so happens that I'm the preacher, and so uh, I'm really excited to be back in the pulpit uh, to share with you again this morning. Let us pray. God of grace, we ask that as your Spirit inspired the writing of your word, 
that in these moments our hearing of it would also be so inspired that we would be transformed closer into the very image of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. When I was around 12 years old, we moved from Southern California to, to Washington State, to Kennewick, my parents' hometown. And we moved in next door to my grandparents. My grandparents, especially my grandfather, loved to tell stories. Weeding the garden, fixing a leaky pipe, making lunch. As they moved throughout their day, they, they told stories. And some of my favorite memories of this time are of sitting on the back porch with my family late into the warm summer nights, listening quietly as, as one of the adults launched into a very familiar story once again, and hoping that my mother would not remember that it was already past my bedtime. Some of these stories that they would tell over and over again were about uh, when they were growing up in, in Appalachia or in the early days of Kennewick. Others were about family members long past. Sometimes, especially with my grandfather, it was hard to tell if the stories were made up or real. Sometimes the stories were about hard times. And sometimes those, those hard times were times of their own making and doing, but most of the time there would always be a twist near the end of the story and everything would work out okay. I was an adult, a parent myself really, before I realized that my mother probably well was well aware of the fact that it was past my bedtime. I think she knew the, these stories were good for me. It was important to hear these stories over and over and over again until I owned them. Because later in life, I would discover that life is often difficult and hard, and I was going to need these stories to get me through. Even to this day, as I think about these old family stories, I sometimes feel like a jeweler who is who's holding up a gem and turning at it, looking at the different facets, seeing it from different sides. Sometimes, of course, I see the the obvious and clear point that they wanted me to get, that life is sometimes hard and challenging and difficult, and you have to wait until the grace twist comes at the end and you realize it's going to come out all right. But then I turn the story a little bit. And then all of a sudden I find myself focused on the waiting part of the story and how they remain strong through the waiting, not knowing how it would all turn out. Turn the story again a little bit, and all of a sudden I'm thinking about the import, how important the family ties were in those times of waiting and during the hard times, and how, how the ties were strengthened through all that. That's something of what the parables of Jesus are all about. They're family stories. They're not illustrations or fables. They're not ornaments hanging on Jesus' theology. They are the theology told in ancient Semitic tradition of rabbis who, who proclaim their truth in story, often very open-ended stories. And like a gem, they have so many facets, so many sides to them. Many of us were taught that parables are simple stories that Jesus used in order to make what he was teaching easier to understand. But the problem is that the parables are very often confusing, and, and very often even Jesus' own disciples don't understand the parable, and they have to, to go back to Jesus for an explanation. And so if anything, the purpose of a parable is the opposite of what many of us learn. Parables pull our minds into the story to, to confound them, to confuse them. And, and that kind of dislocation from our usual ways of thinking helps us to open up and let go of our usual ways of thinking. A parable is meant to transform you as you wrestle with it. A parable is meant to, 
to shock you, confuse you, and drive you to Jesus as you search for a way to understand it. Each of Jesus' parables ends in a shocking reversal of his listeners' expectations. And with that reversal, the story pulls us out of entrenched patterns of relationship and ways of being in the world. It dislocates us from what's comfortable to free us to establish new kinds of relationship, new ways of thinking, and new ways of being. In the words of of Ken Bailey, these parables are theological clusters and all sorts of ideas rush into them and rush out of them again. Anyone with ears to hear, anyone in tune with the Holy Spirit who does the rushing in and out of these parables can hear them. You can hear them. You are in the family. These stories belong to you. They tell you who you are. All you have to do is sit on the warm summer porch of worship and listen with your heart. A farmer strapped his bag of seed to his back and went out to sow his field. This ancient sower begins this very familiar task, casting out the seed from the bag, not overly careful about where the seed goes. And the point here seems to be just to get the seed out. Some of it inevitably falls onto that hard-worn public path between fields. This seed doesn't have a chance. It's not even going to germinate before the birds come to eat it. And Some of the seed falls on rocky ground. And, and some of that seed does germinate and it springs up, but the rocky ground doesn't allow these plants to grow roots. And when the sun comes out, it just scorches the plants right on the spot. Some of the seed, the sower knows, will start out all right. But then weeds and thorns are going to come along and just snuff them out. Thankfully, thankfully, some of the seed falls onto good ground and that's where the harvest come from, comes from. It, it produces And that's the end of the story. Time for bed now, where you can go and lie on your back, stare at the ceiling, and wonder what that story was all about. You can just keep turning in over and over and over, looking at all the sides. Where do you find yourself in this story? Are you the sower who's come to worship trying to figure out why your life hasn't turned out the way you expected? Are you the seed trying to figure out how you landed on this hard path where where everybody walks on you all the time? Or are you one of these options of ground? A rocky soil, perhaps too defended for the love and truth of the gospel to make its way through? Or have you been nurturing some weed that is close to choking out the seed of hope? Have you come to worship wondering what it would take to become good soil, hoping that something wonderful could happen in you and through you? There's about 12 sermons there, and any of them are viable. Depends on how you look at it. That's the blessing of this parable. It has all these facets. But don't worry. Today I'm just going to preach one sermon. Uh, the facet of the story that, that seized me this week as I delved into this story. A farmer goes out to sow some seed. What's so surprising about that? Remember, Jesus' parables are supposed to have surprise and shock in them. But, but farmers sow seed all the time. And, and anyone who knows anything at all about what a plant needs to grow won't be surprised to hear that that the seed cast into the middle of the road or, or among rocks or among thorns doesn't grow. It's not at all surprising that that most of the seed doesn't grow. What is surprising is that the farmer chose to sow it there. This isn't a rich man we're talking about. This is almost certainly a poor farmer, a tenant farmer. 
who can only eke out a living for himself and his family if he not only makes wise choices about where to sow, but is also blessed with good weather and a good deal of luck. Good seed is hard to come by. And so the wise farmer makes sure to entrust the precious grain he has to the best of soil. But this foolish farmer tosses seed about while standing in the closest thing he can find to the parking lot at Costco, where the birds will eat it if thousands of feet and truck tires don't grind it into the ground first. In short, this farmer behaves as though that were which was most precious, was limitless in supply. What on earth is he thinking? It's a wonder to us, we who are responsible and careful and hardworking members of the family, the sower is not particularly careful with the seeds. He's just flinging it out and and letting it fall where it may. But here's the real shock of the parable. God blesses a farmer like this beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Normally, a a farmer who who reaps a twofold harvest would be considered fortunate. A fivefold harvest would be cause for celebration throughout the village, a bounty attributable only to God's particular and rich blessing. But this Foolish farmer who, in a world of scarcity, casts his seed on soil everyone knows is worthless, is blessed by God in shocking abundance, a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 times what he sowed. I know times are tough right now. The pandemic and its effects on our economy have forced scarcity upon us. Money is tight. Time is hard to spare. Even when we're looking at less tangible and measurable qualities we value, things like love and blessing, there's sometimes a sense that that the good things that God has for us are in such limited supply that the only kind of good and responsible stewardship is to guard it very carefully to give it only to those we are sure are worthy of it, and to protect it like like the last egg of an endangered bird. Predictions of peril and doom provoke a great deal of anxiety in these times. We're living on a knife's edge, and that tends to to shut down the kind of creative and life-giving vision that energizes us to live more deeply into God's dreams for us as individuals, for our communities, and and for our world. So what might this parable have to say to us in these times? What if God is the foolish farmer who flings the seed out carelessly? Well, if a farmer sows corn, he expects to harvest corn. If a If a farmer sows wheat, he expects to harvest wheat. The overwhelming message of the Gospels, of of Jesus' teaching, is that if we know anything about God, it's that God loves. That God wants love for us, God wants love from us, and wants us to love each other. And so what if God sows love? What if God sows a word of love? That it would seem logical for God to expect love. What is it that God showers on the world? It could be blessing or or justice or grace. All of these are precious gifts that God seems to treat as limitless in supply. The parable of the sower has become a, a foundational story for me. It's a story I go to again and again. And it has transformed the way I think about life and ministry. I'll end with this story. My first year out of seminary, I pastored a church that had a, had a benevolence fund administered by the pastor, so me. So this is a pretty common thing, and many churches have a similar setup. I'll admit to you that, that I felt totally unprepared for the task. Thankfully, 
I had inherited a set of guidelines to help guide me as I met with people and, and tried to help them with these funds. The guidelines I have been given asked me to interview those coming to the church for help to make sure that they were eligible. Were they from the town that the church was located in, or were they just passing through? Did they have a job? Were they sober, or did they struggle with drugs or alcohol? And once I had interviewed them and made sure they were eligible, made sure they were deserving, I could then give them several forms of help, limited as they might be. A night in a motel, a voucher for food or gas, help with a utility bill. I will confess to you that that while at first I was grateful for some framework with which to approach this work of helping people, it it very quickly, within a couple weeks, became unbearable. I felt totally inadequate to judge who deserved help and who did not. I can remember agonizing about whether the person I helped really needed the help. Had I wasted the little resources we had on someone undeserving? Or what about the person I I didn't help? Did they really need it? Had I messed up? It tore me up inside. And then one week... As I was preparing for worship in the sermon, I encountered uh, a story I knew so well, the parable of the sower. But this time, it it landed with me a little differently. I saw a different side to the story than I had before. We at the church liked to talk about how the help we gave others was an expression of God's love. What if we Followed the, sower's, followed the sower's example, and cast seeds of love indiscriminately? What if we didn't try to figure out if people really needed help or deserved it, but just loved them and helped them just because they were asking, just because they were a human being in need of help? There were many reasons not to. We were worried about running out of funds. What if people took advantage of us? But can someone really take advantage of you if if all you want to do is love them unconditionally? Can you ever really run out of God's love? What does this morning's gospel say to us in a story that suggests that God is like a farmer who tosses seed into parking lots for the pigeons to eat and in the surprising harvest that grows? Well, God has blessed us richly. And God's people have been entrusted with with that which is most precious in the world. But most ironically, these precious commodities only gain value. The seed of God's word only bears fruit when God's people scatter it, absolutely heedless of who is worthy to receive it. We don't have to wonder who is worthy of receiving God's love. God has already deemed all of us worthy of love and justice and grace. And so we who who follow Christ, we who are God's people, are called to sow these things abundantly and foolishly. We are called to treat God's love, God's justice, and God's grace, precious as these things are, as though they were absolutely limitless in supply for one simple reason. They are. Amen.
Let's pray together. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for your grace, your justice, your love. These things are so precious to us. They are life-changing. Help us, though, O God, to not hoard these treasures. Help us to be good stewards of them and spend them just as you would. Help us to be extravagantly generous. Help us to be even foolish with your love, your justice, and your grace. That our own lives might be transformed and and through us the whole world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Let us go with this benediction. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Have a blessed week. All-knowing He counts not their soul Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more Praise the Lord, His mercy is more Since they have many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they amend, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more.